God has been speaking to me lately that the deepest things he will do in my life start shallow. I, I know this sounds like a contradiction of everything you would normally hear in a pulpit because we want, we want a deep sermon, a deep word from God, one that we can't understand so then we don't have to obey. But while I was reading the text, I was drawn to verse 11. I was like, yes, Lord, I want to follow you wherever you lead. Though none go with me. I stood. That's the second verse of the hymn you didn't learn when you were a kid, cherished the one that you were at the club and they were singing in church. It said, though none go with me, I still will follow. Yes, Lord, I just want to go into the unknown. I will follow you, Lord. I will follow you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And the Lord's like, kid, you hadn't even read your you version Bible plan. Start shallow. That's about the deepest thing that you could do. Leave everything and follow him. But, but notice in the verse. It's in the verse. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. I don't understand everything about decision-making science, but I understand something about Scripture, a little bit about Scripture. I understand a little bit about Scripture. And it said that, that, the, that the boats were at the water's edge. The crowds were coming around. And in verse 3, he got in a boat and asked him to put out a little. I stopped when I read the word little. And I realized that before they left everything, they did a little thing. So the reason that we keep on deciding to do stuff, and then we go from deciding to disruption to denial, it's a cycle. Deciding to disruption to denial, the reason sometimes is because we, we stay too deep. And I want to give you a story that I never had the guts to share before right now, but something about this year has made me a little bolder. I don't know if it's just that I think that Jesus is coming back next Thursday and it doesn't matter anyway, so get me out of here. Whatever. I, I feel a little conspiracy theorist rising up in me this year. I don't know. I never had all that before, but it's coming now. Anyway, when I was going through a period of criticism, and I'm not going to live in it because God knows it, it was about this time in 2013. Many were in the church, and it was weird because it was, it was more criticism than we had ever experienced as a church. It kept coming. That's all I want to say about that part. I lived in fear for six months. And to really tell you the extent of it, let me tell you the text that I sent to Chunks after about three months of it. I said, if anything happens to me and I don't make it, you got Holly and the kids, right? I wasn't suicidal. I just didn't know if I could keep day after day after day. I was trying to preach through it, and I didn't know if I could or something bad would happen. I didn't know what bad would happen. but So during that time, that'll make you pray. And it'll make you pray deep things. Lord, I need your peace. I need your vindication. Some of the things, many of the things they're saying are not true and they're twisted. And, and I don't want to keep having to deal with this. So, Lord, to deliver me. When I tell you what brought me peace, you are not going to be satisfied. Because while I was praying the deep prayers, you know, uh, I found some prayers in the Psalms where David was praying stuff like smash my enemies' heads against a rock. I found some great scriptures during that time that I never saw before. Very, very meaningful to me. But now, my answer wasn't on my Bible app. It was on my Twitter app. Hmm? And when I decided to delete Twitter. I know that sounds shallow, but that little… I don't even know if people use Twitter anymore because I haven't been on it really in seven years. They put stuff out. That's not me. That's somebody on a computer somewhere putting Bible verses out in my name. I can't go on there. I can't go on there. And I was telling my friend, it's like, 
when I deleted all this stuff. Now, I'm going to tell you what God's going to speak to some of you through this sermon today. He's going to tell you to delete something that is defeating you. Because you think victory is so deep. The battle is the Lord's, but the app is yours. The brain is yours. The decision is yours. And when I deleted Twitter, I told my friend, it's like I thought there were, there were mountain lions in my yard waiting to attack me. And then I saw it was just squirrels. It was just squirrels. And, and, and I, I thought, I can't survive it because I was surrounded by squirrels. I know it sounds so silly. I prayed. I said, God, I can't tell them to do that. I need to, it's, it's, it's a lot of stuff going on in people's life. I need to go to the book of Revelation. Book of Revelations. Put an S on it. Book, I need to go to the book of Revelation. I need to go into the beast, the mark of the beast, the 666, the number of the beast. God says some of the, some of the, some of the things that they're praying for me to deliver them from, I have given them the power to delete. Can I preach a shallow sermon? Jesus didn't call them to leave their boats. He called them to push out a little. It's a little decision. I was, I was talking to a friend about depression. They said, uh, uh, have you gone for a walk today? I'm like, you don't hear me. It's spiritual warfare. They said, no. I said, walk, not war. You're trying to be so deep. You don't need God to give you the victory. You need to go get some vitamins. And I'm not saying that I'm not saying that the problem isn't deep. I'm saying that sometimes the solution is so simple. Lord, give me a simple solution. Not just what they did. Put out a little bit from the shore. Hey, put out a little bit from the shore. Hey, leave a little bit of this space. What, what one thing are you willing to do different with this addiction that's so deep in your life that you don't think you'll ever be free, free from it? Will you do a little thing different? And that, that little event, that little thing led to something so massive that Peter would be the one who would preach the Holy Spirit into the earth in Acts chapter 2. If you read the sermon in Acts 2, you'll be like, this dude is deep. He didn't start deep. He started shallow. I just don't want you to think it's always that deep. It was a little decision. How many believe that's a little decision just to put your boat out a little bit and let me use it for a few minutes while I teach? That's a little decision. I think I'm going to watch uh, church, Elevation Church today. That was a little decision. But God can do a deep thing with a shallow start. Now, I think if I were the devil, I'd try to get you so overwhelmed with something that felt so deep that you wouldn't do something so simple. I think that's his strategy, but God's strategy was very simple. Remember, these are the ones that Jesus wants to use. It's a little bit of a trick because he's asking. Uh, them to carry him in the boat, but he really wants them to become boats so that the gospel can go out through them. And it's really a picture. It's really a picture of the purpose that he's given them. This helped me. He put out a little bit, and then Jesus preached. And then verse four, when he had finished speaking, somebody say first the word. First the word. He said to Simon Peter. Put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Now let's go deeper. So put out a little, now put down the nets. Put, put out a little, now put down the nets. Put out a little, put down the nets. Don't try to do too much at first. Don't leave the boat yet. I need it right now. Put out a little, put down the nets. I think this is really powerful. I, 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 don't think it's, I don't think it's a small thing. I really don't. The more I study it, the, the more I realize that, that every decision that others see contains millions of little decisions that were invisible. 
So how could they do that? How could, why would they make that decision? There were a million little decisions. When they said, I do, they never thought there would be a time when they didn't. And, and I remember early in our marriage getting in a fight with Holly on the phone, and, and we, one of us hung up on the other one. I don't know which one hung up on the other one. I really don't remember the details of this, maybe conveniently, but I remember one of us hanging up, and I remember talking about that and saying, we're never going to do that again. We're never going to hang up the phone on each other in the middle of a conversation again. Because nobody walks away from someone that they gave their heart to all at once. Decisions have momentum. So today I hang up on you. Five years later, I hate you. Because I put out a little. See, this works both ways. Nobody decides, I would like to be straddled with an addiction that will follow me to the grave. Nobody decides that. What I do decide sometimes is I don't want to feel the way I feel, so if I do that, I won't have to feel this. The decision has momentum. And isn't it a horrible thing for somebody who's, who's 11, 12, 13 years old that they can look at something on their phone and out of curiosity, they can see something that will take them into a place that will wrap them with something that will limit them the rest of their life from being able to be free mentally. Nobody decides, I want to have something that masters me the rest of my life. That's not the decision. But decisions have momentum. Because I was impressed by what they did push out the boat and let down the nets. These are the nets they just got done washing. These are the nets. These are big nets. One guy said that they were 25 feet in diameter, so it takes a long time to clean them. And they're made of linen, so if you don't clean them, they're going to rot and they're not going to last very long. And I thought it was cool that they were just fishing. They didn't go out that day to decide to follow Jesus. They went out to catch fish. Can we talk about daily decisions for a moment? This is what they did every day. What do you do every day? What do you do every day? This is not what they did on Christmas and Easter. This is what they did every day. This is what they, not what they did on New Year's Eve. Like the calendar is going to change your habits. I have no idea what this motion is. Don't even worry about it. The point of the illustration, the point, I don't know where that came from. The point of the illustration is this is what they did. What do you do just by being there? Now I'm telling you that this is Bethsaida. This is a fishing village. Bethsaida means house of the hunt. But they fished. They were fishermen. They were from Bethsaida. That's where Peter was from, Bethsaida. So guess what you do when you grow up in a fishing village? You fish. It wasn't deep. It wasn't a decision. Peter didn't go to a job fair, take an Enneagram and a Myers-Briggs, an ESTNJ, LMNOP, ADD, ADHD, none of that. We want a deep, God, I want a calling from you and a purpose in my life. And on a faith. Deep goes to deep. He went fishing, and he caught nothing. Can you make a positive decision even after you've experienced a negative result? This is what amazed me. See, when I get on a roll, I can do amazing things. I can do amazing things. When I get on a roll, it's like boom, knock them down. Boom, there's another one. Boom, another one. Boom, another one. I don't mean to bring DJ Khaled up here with me on the stage, but I just I feel like sometimes I can get in a zone. This is not the situation. This is not the event. It was after the event of a failed night of fishing at the point where they were vulnerable because they were exhausted that they did what he said anyway, and 2020 has been a year for us to have to learn how to do what we know God has called us to do anyway. And to know that we can have a feeling and not act on it and make a different decision. Have a temptation and not act on it. You know how grace is the power to cover your sin? It's also the power to change your decisions. 
And only because you're frustrated doesn't mean you have to make decisions that create more frustration. When they did what Jesus told them to do, when they obeyed the word of God, and that might mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people. That might not mean anything having to do with a fishing net, but it could. It could be a career thing. I always get scared when I preach like this that people are going to take Luke 5, 11, quit their jobs, and leave their boats and follow him. But I'm going to tell you something. If you leave your boat without a backup plan in this economy, it's going to be a minute before you're going to leave your apartment, leave your house too, because they are not going to take the message of the Lord as a mortgage payment. So you better be very careful that you put out a little bit from the shore. Praise him. Glory to his holy name. And the 24 elders said amen. amen. <laughs> but see, decisions have momentum, right? So put out a little bit from the shore, put down the nets, boom, 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 ba, 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 and their nets were breaking. But the nets were not the only thing that broke in that moment. When I obey the word of the Lord, it breaks the flow. Of frustration. We fished all night, caught nothing. Frustration. When he put down the nets, not only did the nets break because God blessed them so much because they were just obedient, not only did the nets break, but so did the flow of their frustration. So did the flow of their failure. So did the flow of their fear. You do not think your way out of the flow of fear, failure, and frustration by thinking deeper about it. It broke the flow when they did something different. I'm going to have to talk to people different. I'm going to have to manage my thought life different. I'm going to have to manage my time different. I'm going to have to manage my money different. And we hear the truth and we still won't tithe. And it would break the flow. It would break the flow of everything that comes to me is for me, and it would open me to receive the blessing of God. And we hear the truth, and the word of God speaks from our boat. Jesus gets done speaking, and we still won't drop the nets. I heard the Lord say, Drop it. I heard the Lord say, Drop it. That applies to every offense that you've been carrying. Drop it. That applies to every empty net that's in your life where you've been failing and carrying the failure around, of fishing all night and catching nothing, and what you did last week, and even the fight that you had before you clicked on this YouTube video, and even the stuff you looked at online before you came to online church today. I heard the Lord saying, Drop that. Drop that. Sometimes we, 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 don't, we don't drop the net. Because we're we're so busy, we're so we're so caught up in, in the discouragement. You know, it's really hard to drop the net when you're drowning in disappointment. I make good decisions when I'm in a good flow. Oh, this worked and that worked, and this did good, and that did good. That is not the occasion in Luke 5. That is not why they left everything and followed him. He got in their boat at a bad time. How annoying is this? He came in their boat as a distraction. You say, well, Pastor Steve. Yeah, I'm back on it. The Lord is never a distraction. It was for Peter. He was trying to wash his nets. He was still dealing with a night of coming up empty. And God was trying to fill him in that moment with not only fish but faith. Hey, thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. And share this video with a friend. And don't forget, you can join me live every Sunday. Thanks again for watching.